This is episode 64 with Jake Thompson. Welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, the show that empowers you to become the hero of your life's journey. With your host, Brian Tier. Hey guys and girls, welcome back to another episode of the Quarter Life Comeback Podcast, episode 64 today and I'm really excited to be speaking to none other than Jake Thompson. Now before we get to the episode, once again this episode is brought to you by Nomad Accelerator which is a two-week in-person boot camp that transforms participants into successful digital nomads. The boot camp is taught by established online entrepreneurs and digital nomads from around the world that are flown in to teach people the skills that have helped them to accelerate their nomad lifestyle. Not only will the coaches share their knowledge on stage, but you'll actually sit down with them and be guided through a one-on-one uh, process of setting up and scaling your own online business. If you want to find out more about it and uh, you know watch some promo videos and all that good stuff, head on over to bootcamp.nomadaccelerator.com and make sure you use the referral code QLC, that's QLC for quarter life comeback, and you'll get a $250 discount. Once again, that's bootcamp.nomadaccelerator.com. Right, back to the episode, and I'm speaking to Jake Thompson. Now, in case you haven't heard of him, Jake is a speaker, entrepreneur, and the founder of the awesome lifestyle brand, Compete Every Day. After college, Jake wanted a career that would help him create a legacy that he was proud of, and he wanted to find a way to create a business and a message for someone that wanted to pursue greatness in their life. Now, Jake spent a few years building a very successful marketing business before a book changed his entire perspective and sent him on a new path at the age of 26. He spent months trying out different projects before settling on Compete Every Day and inspiring others with the idea that their life is worth competing for. Now, six years later, Jake has turned what started as a t-shirt company in the back of his car into a thriving brand community and a team spreading the positive mindset. Now, in this episode, you're going to learn how Jake experimented with different projects to find his business, how to stand out in a crowded market, how to use affirmations to get what you want, Jake's tips for doing mentorship the right way, three simple ways to start competing every day, and the first step in creating the life you want. As always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned at bryantier.com slash 064, but for now, let's go hang out with Jake. Welcome back, everyone, and a big welcome to today's guest. I'm really excited to be speaking to Jake Thompson. Jake, welcome to the Quarter Life Comeback. Oh, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here this morning. Yeah, I'm excited to be speaking. Um, I came across you, I think it was through Twitter. I can't remember exactly. Um, And I really picked up a cool energy from you and and love the work that you're doing, which we'll discuss in a second. But for people who aren't aware of who and what it is that you do, why don't you tell us a bit about, um, you know, your Quarter Life story? Yeah, yeah. So my name's Jake. Uh, I am the chief encouragement officer at a brand called Compete Every Day. I started it about six years ago, uh, which would have been my mid-20s. I went through a period, uh, I'd done sports agent work. Jerry Maguire, if you've ever seen the movie, was my dream growing up. Um, And so wanted to start that career, get into that space. And the more I got into it, the more I realized at the time it wasn't for me. Um, And so I got out, started doing consulting, uh, built what I like to call a really nice sandcastle with my consulting business, doing marketing, design, social media, and just really wasn't fulfilled. And I laugh that I was the first one of my friends to have a midlife crisis in my 20s, which therefore we've obviously laughed as well as about a quarter life crisis, but I wanted to do something of value and build something that would live beyond my name and, and impact others beyond just adding another zero to my bank account. Um, so I had this idea of competing for your life and what that could look like if someone were to pursue greatness in multiple areas of their life. And after a number of months trying to fit a square peg in a round hole with different projects, I uh, ultimately settled on apparel um, and took off selling t-shirts from the trunk of my car. 
Yeah, I love it. Um, and I want to get into that in a second. But I know when we chatted via email, you said that you read a book, I think you were about 26, that completely changed yeah. your, your view and things. What was that book? And what was the message that really changed your outlook? Absolutely. The book is uh, by a guy named Donald Miller. Uh, the book is A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. And in the book, uh, Miller had written a successful first book called Blue Like Jazz, and movie producers had approached him about turning that into a movie. And so A Million Miles was essentially the memoir timeline of them trying to turn this book into a movie, and what he learns makes a powerful, great story, regardless of whether that's a book, um, a movie, a short story, whatever the case may be. There's certain elements in Miller's uh, came to find out that make a story great. And, and the more he went down this path, the more he realized that those same elements make for a great life. And that too many times we settle for pursuing, you know, certain things that we never encounter conflict. We never step out of our comfort zone. Uh, we never do anything that invite others to join alongside of us. And it was kind of a challenge book to pursue a better story with your life, create a better story with your life, because the words that we say, the actions that we take, the story that we live every day ourselves, tell others what we believe is important, um, not only about ourselves, but about the world um, and who's important. And so that kind of shook me quite a bit because I was, you know, kind of going through a, a phase already where I was starting to question a little bit of what I was doing from a work standpoint. Um, and that just kind of took it to a whole other level um, because it, it was kind of the wake up call of I wasn't living the story that I wanted to. Um, you know, I loved growing up comics and superheroes and people saving the day and all, all types of great stories and movies. But I wasn't living that way. And so that book was really a wake up call for me to say, all right, if you want this if these things are important to you then you've got to start living that way yeah i love that you actually like so so often it's easy to just read a, a book or watch a movie and feel inspired and then go on living the same way and and just thinking like oh well you know it's only a certain kind of person or you've got to be a special person to achieve or do cool things and i love that you actually applied it and and have now turned that into what you're doing now um, and it's the same when I was doing my corporate job, I had this realization that no one's going to make my life awesome for me. And if I wanted something different, it was up to me to go and make that happen. Um, I'm really glad we're discussing this because I had an email last week, actually, from one of my listeners who he said, you know, he loves the show and he loves hearing people's success stories, but he'd love to hear examples of people who have gone through some kind of quarter life crisis and then created something completely new and different um, to what they were doing, aside from like people who get into coaching or, or mentorship or that kind of thing. And this is exactly what you've done. Um, so I'd, I'd love to find out how you made that transition from from reading the book and being like, you know, holy crap, I need to do something different um, to, you know, getting out of that old uh, career that you were in and pursuing your own thing now. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of it for me, I, I love to have something to focus on. I, I kind of, it's almost like I need a rallying cry sometimes. And so I just started tinkering. Um, you know, I, even I obviously was still consulting um, and just started playing with words and phrases, something that I could either, at the time I was thinking I would rebrand my consulting business to have a little bit more of an impact. I would thought I would pull in maybe a, a nonprofit giving angle. And so I kept tinkering with words until really the word compete stood out one day. And I, I'd always loved that word. I was smaller in sports growing up. And so the idea of me versus you is something I lived for because being smaller, it was the opportunity to prove that I could outsmart and outwork more talented opponents. Um, and I and I thrived on those opportunities and and lived for those opportunities, and this time looking at that word, it was more of a me versus me, mm. and the idea of competing against myself to be better than I was yesterday, and because that's something that we can all relate to. Like you know, I, I'd been out of team sports for 
years outside of, you know, playing in city league stuff or intramural stuff. And that competitive drive, I, I felt always pushed me to be my best. And so what if I turned inward and started competing against myself? And so I had this idea and I had the brand message and I asked a few friends about it and they immediately jumped on it. One, they answered that it fit me and my personality incredibly well. But two, they started identifying things that were different for them. You know, one person would be competing for something physical in terms of a sport. They had a half marathon or an Ironman they were training for. And for them, it was that kind of competition to, to push their limits physically. Where another friend, she's pursuing a, a corporate career and professionalism and, and has goals um, of where she wants to be and what she wants to do within that career that she's competing for and competing to achieve. And so of that, I really just started to understand that there could be something here uh, just based on the the responses and, and the diversity in those responses. And so I spent six to eight months, I would say, tinkering with different projects. You know, first I tried to apply it to my consulting business and did just it was a weird explanation to people and they were like, well, why are you changing? And I get that. But how does this fit with consulting? And and then I looked at doing some ca nonprofit camps and, and maybe trying to get some youth camps up and going and even looked at a fitness portal for all things Dallas Fort Worth and nothing really kind of gained traction. The more I talked to some people and we'd run down a certain path for a little while, nothing ever caught on. And my best friend roommate at the time suggested I look at this company out of Boston called Life is Good. And the Jacobs brothers started, I believe, in the late 80s. And they built this $100 plus million dollar apparel company on the idea that, that life is good, the power of optimism. And I didn't know any better at the time, but I thought, what the heck? Uh, he and I had been saving for a guy's trip to New Zealand. He ended up spending his budget on an engagement ring for his now wife. Um, and instead of me deciding to go solo, I ended up putting that trip budget um, into a couple of boxes of T-shirts and tank tops and just started selling them to anyone that I could uh, bend their ear long enough and tell them about this message. I love it. I think there's two really key lessons there is you experimented with different things, which I keep saying is one of the best ways, you know, people often you hear nowadays people saying like, how do I find my purpose? I think experimenting is one of the biggest ways to do that. And the other was that you ask people around you um, and you kind of got feedback of, of what people thought would do well and then carried on experimenting based on that. I think those are really two key lessons. Um, why? I know you spoke about, you know, the apparel stuff and finding life is good. There are so many apparel companies already. Um, <laughs> and you know, what I want to know is how did you decide that that was going to be the thing? And well, maybe it was just another experiment, but how did you stand out in such a saturated market? Uh, the apparel really was just another experiment. Um, you know, I have no background in e-commerce, in apparel, screen printing, anything like that. And so for me, it looked like a good idea. I you know, I'd been doing some stuff at the time. I'd been pretty new into the CrossFit community. And so I'd see people wearing shirts all the time, T-shirts. And I was like, okay, there may be some opportunities in the active market. They get the word compete. Uh, but really, it was just my best friend throwing it out and me deciding, all right, these other ideas haven't worked. Let's try something else. Um, and then in terms of standing out, I've always been about day one, since day one, understanding that we went into that crowded market. And so for us, the story we told had to be more important than the T-shirt. You know, we had to create a why and a message that people could get behind that the what of buying a shirt almost became automatic. Because you were either wanted to be a part of that community, you were inspired <laughs> by the compete message, um, or you were inspired by something we'd done that hit you on your journey where you are. Um, and so that's been really at the forefront of what we've tried to do and what I've tried to do since the start. You know, a handful of people I, I brought in early on, consultants to kind of help me learn some of that space and get the business up and running. Uh, were a little disappointed and frustrated with me because I would lead with the story. 
I wanted to push why we did what we did, what it meant to compete for your life over pushing a number of the products. And, and that obviously confused them as to why we wanted to lead with the story and not push the products. But for me, it was about building that message, building that community, inspiring that community in a way that they would be with us for as long as we were around. And they would continue to spread that message for us um, because the idea was, you know, if we had a hundred or a thousand people that loved compete every day and were willing to spread the compete every day message for us, that's more powerful than anything we could do from an advertising standpoint, from a promotion standpoint, anything like that. And so um, that's just kind of been the the push. You know, we told a lot of stories on our blogs early on of people that were competing every day what it looked like from the athlete uh, to the person doing the mud run on the weekends to the mom or dad who is just trying to raise kids by themselves without a spouse and, and what their struggles look like and what they continue to compete for so that people had a great look at what the diversity was and what it meant to compete for your life. Um, and then we paired that with pretty clean, simple messaging that all fit around the idea of life is worth competing for. And so all of our shirts, regardless, we have a couple of ones that are a little more playful and, and funny, uh, but each shirt inside the neck would have a, a tag that says my life is worth competing for today as, as that reminder when you put it on. And then a majority of them uh, printed on the front or on the back are, are messages that remind you to compete for your life when you put it on. Mm -hmm whether it's a little more of the aggressive look uh, of kind of our set goals um, and smash them type shirt, um, or it's just the simple lift your dreams, drop your excuses, um, just subtle marks that we want people to know. And so, you know, the, the space continues to be crowded. I feel like technology's changed it to where anyone can have a t-shirt company within two hours and, and create a pretty funny shirt. Um, and I used to worry about that a lot more than I do now. Um, but now we, we're so deep into telling our story, focusing on how we can serve our community that um, it's almost like we have blinders on to to really everything else. Um, and that's only helped us accelerate course. Exactly. Yeah. Like you said, it's so much more than just a t-shirt company. Um, it, it's the why behind it. And I, I love that, um, you know, all the things that kind of aligned to, to get you to this point. Like, you, you've got to wonder if your friend hadn't bought that engagement ring if this wouldn't have, would have even existed <laughs> like you might have gone on the trip to new zealand and then not had the budget to start a company um yeah it, I, it's really I, cool how things work out i had a guy it's funny i gave a keynote speech uh about two weeks ago and had a guy in the audience ask me that question and he was like if you'd gone on that trip how would things be different yeah and I, and I honestly, I laughed. I said, you know, I have no idea. I know that I would have continued to experiment with Compete. Um, I know that if I, if he had suggested apparel and I was still looking at it and maybe didn't have the budget at the time, I would have found a way to find the budget and create the budget either from taking on some extra client work um, or anything of that nature to get it up and off the ground. Um, but I would have continued to tinker and experiment. I can only hope that at some point that clothing t-shirt route came across, but it also might not have been the death of Compete. It, it might have just started as something different and eventually came to what it is today because you know we're, we even continue to evolve the brand and, and tweak and change things as, as we grow um, just like any other company did. I mean, I laugh, uh, if you've read the, the book shoe dog by Phil Knight, yeah. Nike started as blue ribbon and sold just shoes. And then they came over as Nike and wasn't really the name they were excited about or anything like that. When now you look at it and you're like, man, that's the brand. <laughs> totally. And, and I love as well how, you know, even the nature of your company is, the same spirit that you started this whole uh, movement is, you know, you mentioned being a smaller athlete back in school and having to having to compete and, and show um, what you were capable of. And it's kind of like the question I asked about standing out in the saturated market. It's like, well, now we're going to fight and show people that we're someone to take seriously. Um, I, I've also had requests from listeners to to give some actionable um, steps and advice on the show. And, 
And, you know, a lot of people that I've interviewed have created or, or had big turnarounds in their life. Um, but people are wanting sort of actionable um, things that they can take and actually go use. So what were some of the doubts or challenges that you faced when you were in the beginning stages of growing the company? I know you started from your car boot. Um, and then how did you handle some of those challenges? Yeah, I think a lot of the early challenges and obstacles for me were stepping into something I'd never done before. Um, you have the internal challenges and, and doubts in terms of questioning whether you have what it takes. And I think every person on their journey is going to go through that. And a lot of people tend to think that that's a sign that they're not supposed to do this where I actually think that discomfort and that unknown is something you should lean into um, because it's forcing you outside of your comfort zone a little bit more. And so for me, a lot of it was kind of that internal. So I set up, I had affirmations almost everywhere, um, which, you know, then at the time I was like, man, I don't, do I really need to like put this stuff, but I would like tape to the dashboard of my truck like what I'm competing for, what my goals are. So every day I got in the car, I would look at what's my order of priorities of in life um, about the story I wanted to live. And obviously compete became a piece of that. And so I would see those every day. I had sticky notes on my bathroom mirror. So I was aware of what I was doing. Um, but really, more importantly, I had the daily reminders of why I was doing it. And so when I was frustrated, that was a big one. Um, I tried... I mean, everything in the beginning, like I tinkered with stuff. I wasn't afraid to try a new design or test this or that um, coming out of the gate because one, I didn't know any differently. And two, the only way you start to figure out what look and style fits from an apparel standpoint is start testing stuff. What? Oh, OK. So we have these three designs. Well, this design really worked and these two didn't. So let's create stuff in this similar look or feel and see if it's that. And so then you start to determine whether it's the phrase that people are attracted to or the phrase and the look. And so we tried things. Um, I still have probably 20, 25 shirts left from 2012 of some things that we tried that just didn't work. Um, you know, the other thing I would say from an obstacle standpoint is there's someone out there that has done what you're trying to do mm -hmm. and you may have the opportunity to physically interact with them, but a lot of times we don't. And so that comes down to you getting online and studying everything they're putting out, um, reaching out to them uh, to add value first. You know, if there's someone that you're like, man, that's my mentor, I'm, I'm following them, I want to soak up everything they're talking about, reach out and figure out how you can kind of almost come to them and provide them something of service of value and then ask question and, and don't I always say the approach don't just go to him and be like hey mentor me uh, i laugh i heard tim Sorry. ferris say that uh and it's always stuck with me because i in the way he explained it in one of his podcasts cracked me up but you know i'll get emails sometimes uh from people and they're like hey you know i love that i want to start my own t-shirt line you know what advice do you have and you know, how would you do it? And uh, what do I do? And so a lot of times I, I'll just shoot him a note and say, Hey, give me your phone or your Skype and let's hop on a quick call. Um, it's easier for me when I'm on the go to do that than to sit down and, and type kind of a long response. And so I get to know about them and then I'll be like, Hey, you should try this and this. And then this book would be very helpful as well as this and this. And, you know, I'll set a reminder in my phone a month later and just ping them if I haven't heard from them. A lot of times they'll email me back within the next few weeks, but uh, I'll send a reminder to them. And if I've reached out to them or they've reached out to me and they haven't done any of it and it's like, oh, I haven't gotten to it yet. I'm, I'm a little annoyed of like, why did you reach out to me in the mm -hmm. first place and waste time? And so, you know, when you reach out to those people, run with it um, because they're probably coming from a place of telling you, man, if I'd started now, here's what I'd do differently. Mm -hmm. And so if I started competing with the knowledge I have now, if I was to go back in time and be like younger self, do this, 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 and this, save some headaches here and there from a very specific standpoint on things we tried and, and stuff like that. Um, that's the same approach I have when giving someone else, because I think there's enough market out there for people. And if you're doing something 
that's more than just selling a t-shirt. If it's that important to you, if there's something behind it, then like, hey, I just want to get rich off t-shirts, then there's people out there that want to help you. Um, There's a lot that try to hold it close to the vest, and I think that's any industry. Um, And I think a lot of that has to do with just the classic mindset that information is power. And and it still is today, but especially before the social media and, and a lot of what the internet's become, you didn't have access to a lot of that information. And so people held it close to the vest because they were able to retain that power. But now, and there's so much online, like if you want to learn to do this, okay, cool. Go to Skillshare or Udemy or a zillion other websites to pay 20 bucks and learn what a lot of people go to college to learn. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, I, I'm all for the mentor side of starting out uh, because people will be able to help you. And then experiment. Don't be afraid to try things, test things, do it conservatively where you're not breaking your bank or budget or going into crazy debt just to test something. But don't be afraid to try something um, because I've had a million things that tested that didn't work and you just sweep it under the rug and you're probably the only one that remembers it two to three years down the road. (laughs) If even you. (laughs) Yeah, if even you do. Yeah, I I love that you touch on the mentorship stuff. And for people listening, that is like mentorship 101, everything that you just covered. The other thing that I would add is like, I know you said don't ask a question, then like, you know, just ignore it or not take action. And the the other thing I wanted to add was that, you know, before you reach out and ask someone something, go and look at the other content that they've put out. And, you know, most of the people you're reaching out to probably have a book where they shared those things that that you just mentioned, Jake, like, the, you know, the things they tried and that failed and the things they would tell their younger self. Um, so often we don't even have to reach out to someone to learn from them um, in the in the beginning phases. And you are someone who I kind of look to as a mentor because, you know, having a a t-shirt range is something that I've thought about for a long time. And when I came across you, I was like, man, these designs are really dope. And like your branding is so cool. And so I started like paying attention to what you were doing online. And that's why I'm, you know, really excited to be speaking now again. What, what does it mean to, to compete every day and how, what are some small things we can do to, to actually do that? Yeah. So for me, competing every day is almost becoming an active participant in life. And I've said that for a while, but the idea that you are in charge of your everyday and it's up to you to pursue your goals, your dreams, those things that you desire so much out of life, the relationships that you you want um, to have that ideal relationship with your spouse, your friends, your family, um, and, and really create the life you want on a daily basis. You know, to compete, you can't talk about it. You can't dream about it. To compete, you actually have to do. And so it's that idea of every day being better than you were yesterday, of doing your best. And so some days your best looks very different than other days. I mean, I think it's if you go to the gym, there's some days you walk in and it's like certain weight that you just threw around the week before feels so heavy and you don't know why Um, or you're sick or you're battling with, you know, some major family issues. And so that day, your best looks very different from when it could be. And if you're in a sense of flow and everything's just clicking, but it's your best, you get to the end of the day, you did your absolute best. And so the next morning when you wake up, how can I either build upon yesterday's victories or how can I rebound from yesterday's defeats? And so the idea of each and every day you're competing for those things you want in that life um, in life and those people that you desire to, to live life alongside. For me, the the way I approach how can everyone start immediately and, and starting to compete for their life is identifying what that looks like to you. You know, a lot of us, we have these goals in our heads, but we don't really write them down. And so I always encourage people, if you want to start competing, you've got to know what you're competing for. And and a big piece of that is writing down your goals and dreams, physically writing them by hand on paper um, of what what you want out of life. What are the relationships you want? If you're in, if you're married, what does that marriage look like? How how are ways that you can improve it and be a better husband or wife, um, a better spouse in that relationship? And then once you've got them written down, put them somewhere that you can see them every single day. Like I would tape them to the truck. I would have sticky notes in the bathroom mirror. I might have something in my office, but somewhere every day that gives you a North star to focus on. Um, The other key piece that I have is almost 
what an athlete does after a big game. Uh, you'll always see an athlete, the great ones, watch film, study what they did right, study what they did wrong. Uh, they want to improve the next time they play a game, just like a performer would want to improve the next time they go on a stage to perform a concert or a theater or anything like that. And so for us, a lot of times we get caught up in the day-to-day -day that we don't really evaluate how we did the day before. What are what are our lessons we can learn? So for me, I have a one that's called the five-minute journal, yeah. um, and I'll use it on a daily basis, and I encourage people to have it or something similar to where at the end of every day, not only are they forced to write down something they're thankful for and, and a victory of the day, but what are their three lessons? What did they learn? Because the next morning when you wake up, you're going to see what those lessons were for yesterday and you're able to course correct for the day or prepare in advance that, okay, if this happens, here's how I'm going to respond differently. Um, and then you get down the road a year, two years from now, and you're able to look back and see the things that you struggled with then that you thought were just end of the world stuff. It's like when you're in high school, you think something bad happens in high school and you think the world is over. It's just the worst thing that could ever happen. When in all reality, you know, two years, three years removed from high school, you're like, oh, why did I care about that? And the same applies with our lives. And so for me, it's tracking your life and understanding how are the ways I can build upon because that's how you can get better is by understanding how you reacted previously, evaluating it after the fact, to where you're able to look back and say, okay, this happens again, I want to respond differently, versus just putting it aside and continuing in that negative cycle of responding the way you did, but it's not really how you want to, but you kind of forgot, so you're not staying in the loop on it. And then the third and, and final piece is do something that's going to force you to lean into that discomfort. Mm -hmm. Do something that's going to push you outside of your comfort zone so that you become more comfortable in that state. And it could be something as simple as a 21-day challenge to where, you know, I'm going to go talk to a stranger every day for 21 days. I don't have to have a 30-minute conversation. I can just say hi and small chat at the coffee shop or the, when I'm riding the subway or anything like that to where I'm talking to someone I don't know, I'm initiating that conversation, which is always kind of awkward and discomfort, discomforting sometimes, but doing something that puts you in a, a situation where you're used to it. Um, there's a guy, Ji Zhang, that I've heard speak a few times, and he's got The Art of Rejection is, one of, is the name of one of his speeches, and it may be his book, um, but he talks about he wanted to get over the fear of, of being rejected and just the, the scary and, and discomfort of asking people things because you're afraid of they're going to tell you no. And so he started, challenged himself to spend, uh, I believe, 40 days doing the most crazy things to get people to say no to him. And, and people said yes to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like he, he showed up to a guy's house. He's an adult now in full soccer gear with a soccer ball and, and ask if he could play soccer in the guy's backyard. And the guy let him. Like, he he literally, I mean, he, he did the most crazy things that most of us are like, well, I would never do that. But he did it so that he would not be afraid for someone to say no to him. And it's kind of the same approach. You don't have to go quite the scale that G, that G did, but uh, it's something that I would challenge people to do because it, it's like working out. The more you'll push yourself in a workout to be uncomfortable, to kind of get to that red line to, go a little bit farther than you think you can, the more you're going to be equipped mentally in the rest of your life to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so the more in life that you're willing to step outside of your comfort zone, the more you're going to want to do it in an entrepreneurial pursuit uh, in, in approaching someone of the of interest that you, you desire to spend time with and get to know. It just becomes easier. Yeah, I dig that. Uh, Jake, I do want to be mindful of the time. I've got some quick fire questions at the yeah. end here. The first one is, what do you wish you'd been told in your 20s? What do I wish I'd been told in my 20s? Don't worry as much and don't... Actually, no, I'm going to take that back. The best thing I wish I'd been told in my 20s is busy does not equal productive. Mm, so important. Uh, what is the greatest opportunity for quarter lifers today? 
I mean, the sky's the limit. Uh, I think the opportunity to grow and start something is better than it's ever been. Uh, not only you don't need venture capital, uh, you know, there's access to working capital if you have to have it, but with the internet and all of these social media channels, there's so many opportunities to get your message out, to test, to try things, to do it in such a cost effective or free manner that no one has an excuse for not starting something that they desire, whether that's a goal, whether that's a side hustle, whether that's a full time career. There's so many things from a technological standpoint that, like I mentioned earlier, if you wanted a t-shirt company, you could have one online in two hours. Um, and, and so for me, for them, it's a wealth of information that I think the biggest thing is not to squander the opportunity they have before they're married, before they've got kids and they get tied to a certain income level that they're scared to leave. Yeah, I love it if there's someone listening to this that's wanted to start a t-shirt company and they tweet us and say, I started one in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I would love it. Uh, cool. Jake, I've got one final question before I get yeah. to it. Where can people go to find out more about you and compete and connect with you online? Absolutely. So all of our social media for Compete Every Day is just Compete Every Day. Uh, our website's competeeveryday.com. Uh, say hi, tweet at us. We do a lot on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, we're on Pinterest and YouTube, just not as active as we are those other channels. Um, my personal, I'm probably most active on Facebook and Instagram, and it's just facebook.com and instagram.com slash life is worth competing for. And I would love it if you listen to the episode, you enjoyed it, or if you want to start a t-shirt company and have some questions, I'd love to connect and be able to help if I can. Yeah, I love it. And I'll link up all of that in the show notes um, so people can find that easily. Jake, I just want to take a second to acknowledge you before I get to the final question for, for coming on today, but even more than that, for competing every day yourself and um, you know, not stopping uh, when, when you weren't happy in your job and, and not stopping and, and keep exploring and experimenting and finding that thing you wanted to do. And for connecting to a bigger why that rather than just a, a what, you know, you, it's easy to do something just because you want to make a certain amount of money, but you had a bigger message to share with people. And I love that you've used that as a catalyst to grow your brand um, and being so open to helping other people on the same path. So I just want to acknowledge you for that. The, Thank you. The final question that I have is what one thing can listeners do this week to start creating their own quarter life comeback? Write down what you want your ideal life to look like. The moment you put pen to paper and start writing down that goal, that ideal life, what it could be, you start to put things in motion. Uh, I believe from both a mental perspective of your br your brain starts to look at if this is what we want, it starts working in the background of how can we achieve this. And I think your your mind unlocks to opportunities you may have not been aware of or seen before, as well as you almost create some accountability for yourself. Because if you write it down, it can be seen. And when it's seen, other people want to ask you about it. And that scares us sometimes because it creates, uh, almost turns it real. But it's one of the best things you can do because t making something real starts to put the wheels in motion and say, I, I, so my biggest thing is write it down. What is that goal? What does that life look like? And start competing for it. I love it. Jake Thompson, thank you so much for coming on the Quarter Life Comeback. Thank you, Brian. Enjoyed it. So there you have it, guys and girls. That wraps up episode 64 of the Quarter Life Comeback podcast. And a big thanks to Jake Thompson once again for coming on and sharing a bit about his story and also his uh, you know, his message and his expertise based on his own journey. Thanks also to our sponsor today, Nomad Accelerator, which again is the first ever in-person bootcamp designed to teach you how to become a location-independent online entrepreneur. You can find out more at bootcamp.nomadaccelerator.com and use the checkout code QLC to get $250 off when you apply. Now, if you like this episode, please share it around with your friends on social media and shoot me a tweet at Brian Tier. And uh, let me know what your biggest takeaway was. For me, again, it was the idea of using experiments and projects to find the thing that we really feel passionate and strongly about. 
and uh, you know, then taking that on once we've kind of found that thing. And um, the other big thing that I wanted to share again was the idea of mentorship and not treating it as this intimidating thing, but just reaching out and adding value and you know, asking questions and learning from those who have been there and done what you're trying to do. Now, as always, you can get the links and resources we mentioned in this episode at bryantia.com slash 064. And to get all these episodes as soon as they come out, make sure you subscribe at quarterlifecomeback.com. Thanks once again for joining me this week. And until next time, keep creating your quarter life comeback. Thanks for listening to the Quarter Life Comeback. Get started today by visiting bryantia.com. 